It's Monday, July 15. In the headlines, Jamaica Defense Force working with the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management in hurricane relief efforts. TAJ implements new vehicle ownership transfer policy. In business news, we speak to Executive Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Pan Jamaica Group Limited, Jeffrey Hall. Regionally, the European Union in support of better intra-regional transportation. And in sports, Jamaica wins a netball semis in World Youth Netball Cup. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Officers from the Jamaica Defense Force, including members of the Disaster Assistance Relief Team, DART, are in Rocky Point, Clarendon, assisting the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, ODPEM, with its hurricane relief efforts. Under the directives and guidance of the Office of Disaster Preparedness, and the DART team is essentially here to scale whatever the response is and where it is required so that persons can get relief as soon as possible. Prime Minister Andrew Holness visited the base of the operation over the weekend and received an update on the disaster relief efforts. He says the immediate priority has been the safety and well-being of every affected Jamaican. The Prime Minister, in a social media post, explains that they have mobilized resources to provide temporary shelters, food, and medical care to those displaced, with teams working around the clock to assess damage and begin rebuilding. This effort, he says, is not just about restoring what was lost, but about building stronger and more resilient communities. According to Mr. Holness, in the coming days, the team will continue to distribute relief supplies and provide assistance to families in need. He says they will also be coordinating with local and international partners to ensure support and resources for long-term recovery. Energy Minister Daryl Vaz toured the Jamaica Public Service Company's Control Center on Saturday to get an update on the power restoration exercise across the island. I'm happy that we are able to make some significant inroads into the repairs. There has been significant work done between my visit on Wednesday and now. And what I'm pushing for is to move away from the percentages. So when JPS says that they are 95 or 96 percent, uh, or they have restored 96 to 97 percent of the island's electricity, that doesn't give a sense of distress. That actually makes the numbers look good, uh, which is good. But the bottom line is that there's thousands of persons across Jamaica that still don't have light. JPS had advised that while the vast majority of his customer would have been energized on a Saturday night, July 13, a number of smaller areas will remain out of service. When our new steam toured sections of Manchester on the weekend, some residents were still without electricity. Mr. Gladstone Powell says this fallen light post needs to be removed. He explained that the post is blocking his neighbor's driveway and the lines and wires had to be tied to a tree. But that's not his biggest concern. I was in the house when the first zinc blew off. I mean, go up by the shelter, but two of us was up there at the time. So we stayed there until the morning. So we come down and this is what we see. Man, the three, three Japanese also said me cut it off. Uh, and this one, I mean, if you cut it, you know, if you notice, they cut a big chunk there. They cut a big chunk right now at the front there, so. Okay, so yeah. the entire house is damaged? The entire house is damaged. Alright. So, so we have to put back two sheets of zinc that we can stay at night. He, he tell help come. How much money you will take now to, 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 to fix your roof now, you say, approximately? Approximately about, about one by five or two million dollars. Because the whole roof of the entire tree, as you, as you can see, the, the roof broke up. And the zinc they used to change as well. How many bedrooms and bathrooms? Uh, we have one bathroom and three bedrooms. And the kitchen and the, and the veranda. 
The Ministry of Health and Wellness conducted the first in the series of sensitization sessions on Friday to highlight the renewed focus on the primary health care reform program, dubbed Operation Refresh. This program aims to standardize the health center's infrastructure and increase the number of home visits from the country's more than 2,000 community health aides. The first sensitization session was held in St. Anne. So there is a process that is involved in this program. One is to remind you of the importance of your role and to recognize you for that. And I want to make that very clear. Two is to tweak, not, not radically adjust, but tweak your role so that you will see the greater responsibility of spending more time in the community than in the health center. Now what it means is that your public health nurse is going to guide you. What it means is that you are going to have to be equipped with a kit so you can check a blood pressure if necessary. But you will also have your umbrella if rain or fall and your raincoat. And maybe your water bottle so you can rehydrate. What it means is that you are going to be an important source of information gathering because you go in a big yard and you notice the garbage is not tended to and you see rat run around the place you go back to the public health people and you say to nurse and by extension to the environmental health officer boy we need to do something about that yard otherwise leptospirosis is going to get them people here you see the little boy they play around with the battery lead poisoning is a big issue so you are a critical source of information. What it means is that you have to see yourself as building relationships with your community. That's why a lot of you work in the community where you reside. Because you know the people. It's just a refresh. It's a reminder to you that we have to get going. Otherwise, Rome is going to burn. And we're going to have to take some of the responsibility for that. We don't have enough hospital beds to store people who are hypertensive and neglect to take their medication. Even the better thing for you, why you are so important, is that in the context of community health, outside of the public health nurse who provides supervision for you, and maybe the doctor who works at the health center, the community health aides are the most important person at the level of community. Plans are being put in place to rehabilitate the sandy gully that spans several communities in Kingston. That's the word from Prime Minister Andrew Holness after opposition leader Mark Golding last Monday called on the government to address the damage to the gully following a tour of the channel, specifically at the West Bay Farm Road and Seaview Gardens end. And I agree with you, not from the top. So it, it wouldn't be affecting say like Minister Clark's area, but it would affect your area where you have mentioned the issues of the cleanup around that river, um, that area uh, which is escaping me now. But it is something that the NWA has on its agenda. The National Works Agency had carried out emergency cleanup activities in Sandy Gully ahead of the passage of Hurricane Burrell. Despite the cleanup and repairs over the years, Mr. Honest says the structure has passed its time. The Sandy Gully is in a risky state right now. Uh, it's, the oldest, it's, it's the oldest gully network in Jamaica, Bil built in the 50s. It has reached its useful life. And without question, remember, the gully is carrying more water capacity than it was actually. It's a, it's a huge gully. But if, if you look at the capacity and the speed that it is carrying water at, you, you will begin to appreciate that it is at risk. Effective June 25, 2024, Tax Administration Jamaica has introduced a new policy for motor vehicle ownership transfers aligning with the new Road Traffic Act. Government entities and corporations, 
must now provide TAJ with a written list of authorized officers witnessed by a justice of the peace. Transfers require the vehicle's certificate of title with the entity's seal endorsed by the authorized officer in the presence of a TAJ officer, along with the certificate of fitness, motor vehicle registration certificate, and the officer's ID. Vehicle owners must either endorse the certificate of a title in the presence of a TAJ officer or authorize a representative with a letter or power of attorney stamped and recorded at the Registrar General's Department. For more information, contact TAJ's Customer Care Center at 888-829-4357 or 1-888-GO-JA-TAX or visit their website at www.jamaicatax.gov.jm. Time now for the Business Report with Denise Williams. Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us on The Business Report. I'm Denise Williams, your guide to the latest happenings in the world of business. Florida-based Simply Secure acquired 49.1% stake in T-Tech Limited. Edward Teddy Alexander and Christopher Record, major shareholders in Jamaican managed IT services firm T-Tech Limited have sold 52,012,834 shares the company announced to the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The sale represents 49.1% of the issued shares. The directors of T-Tech says they anticipate that the synergies between T-Tech and Simply Secure will enhance the services provided by T-Tech, particularly in the area of cyber security. Given the market position of Jamaica Producers Group in bananas, plantings, pineapples and products made from same, we sat down and spoke with Mr. Jeffrey Hall on how the passage of Hurricane Beryl affected the export sector of the agricultural market. We are joined by Mr. Jeffrey Hall, who among his many titles has Executive Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Pan Jamaica Group Chairman of Kingston Wharves Limited and Officer of Distinction in the rank of Commander by the Government of Jamaica. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being with us. Good to be here, Denise. Okay, great. Now, what we want to understand is there's your companies, there's an amalgamation, there's Jamaica producers and Pan Jam Jamaica that came together and it resulted in four huge divisions and so you have a sort of intimacy in what's going on in the economy and so but we want to drill it down to bananas plantains pineapples and the products that your company makes from them what has been your estimate of hurricane barrel on the export of agricultural products so jamaica's current agricultural business if you will is fairly diverse both in type of crop and in geography across the island. So obviously there is the uh, Blue Morning Coffee uh, in the east, mountains. There is the banana and plantain business, the tropical produce centered uh, in the northeast, uh, in St. Mary in particular. Um, obviously in parts of the west, uh, southwest in particular, you have uh, root crops, ground provisions, including in the center of the island. And so the outcome is mixed. I can speak very specifically to bananas and plantain. Mm -hmm. In that case, we have a complete destruction wow. of the industry. The estimates range from 85 to 95% of the crop that's in the ground being destroyed uh, by hurricane barrel. The implications of that obviously would be that there's a pay bill that comes into communities in places like Anata Bay. That's a challenge. There are export earnings from bananas. That's a challenge. But the single largest thing 
is really the revenue loss and the reconstruction required to put the business back together. At Jamaica Producers, we have 300 acres of banana and plantain. We've taken a quick decision to go straight back into production, to replant the fields, to prop up plants where we can, and to reestablish the pack houses and commence in what we expect uh, to be a harvest in six to nine months, depending on the parts of the farm about which we're speaking. In terms of order of magnitude, uh, as a sector, it's unambiguously in the billions. And our particular farm, the, the gross adverse impact in terms of loss of revenue and costs to restart will be in the order of 200 million. Jamaican dollars. Jamaican dollars. Okay. And about how many uh, staff is that on your, who works with the 300 acres? That, so that farm has 240 staff members. Yes. And we're in active dialogue with them. We are, we are looking for opportunities for everybody to continue to uh, find roles in the replanting and redevelopment process. Okay. Wow. So you're looking to save 240 jobs. We, we are looking to redevelop the farm 100%. Thank you very much, Jeff. And it's an important commitment yes. um, that we have not only to our business, but to the community. Yes. Uh, JP is the largest single private employer in the entire parish of St. Mary. Wow. And is a hugely important employer in the area in which you do business, which is not to obey. Yes. And so we, um, by virtue of a fortnightly payroll, uh, not only put a pay bill into the community, but also are responsible for health insurance, for families, yes. life insurance. Yes. pensions, yes. and ultimately the, the lifeblood of the community. Yes. It's a responsibility to be taken very seriously. Yes. Well, thank you for standing up with the community. Okay. During trading for the period July 8 to July 12, 2024, the following companies represent the top three most active stocks that investors bought and sold on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Hotel Food and Beverage Distributor, Caribbean Producers Jamaica Limited, with 497 million, 12,908 units, amounted to 77.68% of the market volume in terms of sales of equity for the week. Technology support provider T Tech Limited with 52 million, 61,614 units, amounted to 8.14% of the market volume in terms of sales of equities for the week. Alternative energy provider Wigton Wind Farm Limited, ordinary shares with 18 million, 266,842 units, amounted to 2.8% of the market volume in terms of sales of equities for the week. Over on the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, trading on July 12, 2024, registered a volume of 373,457 shares crossing the floor of the exchange valued at 11,697,867 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 61 cents. ANSA McCall Limited was the volume leader with 137,138 shares changing hands for a value of 8,708,263 Trinidad and Tobago dollars followed by First Caribbean International Bank Limited with a volume of 105,256 shares being traded at 740,000 797 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 80 cents. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives, and companies on the regional stock markets, we turn to the Forex market. On July 12, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that US $45.2 million was bought from Forex traders, while US $48.5 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the US dollar for $157.62 and bought the US dollar for $155.78. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.84, which represents a profit for forex trader for every US dollar traded. 
Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of 61 cents from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $115.66 and bought for $115.05. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $6.89, selling it for $203.58 and buying it for $196.69. For our credit report tip of the day, many persons use the summer months to migrate to a new country, which is an exciting yet challenging journey. One of the key factors that can ease this transition is having a strong credit score. A good credit score can help you secure a rental property more easily in your new country. Landlords in other jurisdictions often check credit scores to assess the reliability of potential tenants. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams. Appreciate your company. Stay well informed. Stay ahead of the curve. Until our next update, take care. In regional news, solving intra-regional transportation woes has been a huge focus of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, particularly now that the region is pursuing an ambitious Guyana-led goal of slashing costly food imports by 25% by 2025. And the European Union stands ready to assist these efforts, according to its ambassador to Guyana, René Vanez. Already, government and private sector stakeholders have been joining hands to figure out how to have cheaper transport ventures and a new regional ferry venture among Guyana, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Barbados, and another private sector venture are in the works. Ladies and gentlemen, it's impossible to think of economic development in the Caribbean without mentioning connectivity and the transport sector. Regional integration and connecting countries and regions and territories is in the DNA of the European Union as we have the world's highest density of transport networks. Among other things, we have set up an investment window with the Caribbean Development Bank to improve maritime connectivity in order to foster regional integration and to promote economic growth. And we are in discussion with a wide range of actors to make sure that transport options for cargo and passenger traffic can be increased in the near future. The Organization of American States has given unanimous support to a resolution led, spearheaded by Antigua and Barbuda on Hurricane Beryl's impact and implications. The resolution was presented to the OAS Permanent Council by Antigua and Barbuda's permanent representative, Sir Ronald Saunders. Garfield Burford reports. Our aim with this resolution is to do good, to do good for those suffering from the impact of Hurricane Beryl, and to demonstrate that this organization of American states cares about their plight and can be depended on to act in their interest. Sir Ron Lady Sanders piloting a resolution of the OAS Permanent Council on Friday on behalf of the 14 independent states of CARICOM. The resolution is entitled Addressing the Impact of Hurricane Barrel and Strengthening Climate Resilience in the Americas. <laughs> Sir Ronald points to the pernicious impact of the record-breaking hurricane, the earliest ever Category 5 in the Atlantic. Underscoring that the disastrous effects of climate change pose a threat to all nations and emphasizing the importance for urgent and full international cooperation to address its causes comprehensively. Aware that previous hurricanes have irreparably damaged many small and medium-sized businesses in OAS member states, leading to increased insurance premiums, rising unemployment, and high poverty levels, and that these conditions will be exacerbated by the impact of Hurricane Beryl on the affected states. The resolution calls for immediate action regarding the loss and damage fund in response to the impact of climate change. To call for the immediate capitalization and operationalization of the loss and damage fund, agreed upon at COP27 and COP28, 
for assisting developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change and, once established, to encourage the fund to provide financial assistance to affected OAS member states as appropriate for rebuilding and reconstruction efforts as well as for building capacity for recovery and resilience to any future disasters. The resolution also makes a direct appeal to international organizations which provide financing to vulnerable states. It is the latest in a chorus of calls for a reform of the global financial architecture. To encourage international financial and development institutions to release funds for SIDS affected by disasters on a concessionary basis, free from onerous conditions, and to cancel, defer, or reschedule debt repayments in order to support the affected countries in their recovery and resilience building efforts. The resolution was adopted by acclamation Friday afternoon. Antigua and Barbuda has been consistently praised for its leadership role on this and several other issues in the hemispheric grouping. In sports, Trinidad and Tobago's under-21 team met Jamaica's team in the semi-final of the World Netball Youth Cup qualifiers in Pointe de Pistre, Guadeloupe on Saturday. At stake was a berth in the Netball World Youth Cup for the winner and both teams went hard for that guaranteed spot. Following a loss to Barbados in their final group stage match, which placed Trinidad and Tobago second in the group, a date with Jamaica in the semi-finals of the America's qualifiers for the World Netball Youth Cup was up next. The match got off to an even start with defense a prominent aspect for both teams. But it was TNT edging ahead in the first quarter and were up by four at one point. But Jamaica pulled it back to end the first 15 minute period. Two goals adrift. 12-10 the score. Trinidad and Tobago went up by three early in the second quarter and kept that distance for long periods. But once again, Jamaica addressed the gap. And by the halftime missile, they were within one. 19-18 the score at the break. The start of the third featured some end-to-end -end action, with defense again being the key component for both teams. The 27-25 score giving TNT the slim advantage going into the final 15 minutes. Midway through the fourth, Jamaica tied up the score at 30 and then turned on the afterburners to leave TNT playing catch-up. Jamaica running away with a seven-goal win, 40-33, to the final score for a place in the 2025 Netball World Youth Cup in Gibraltar. We in Cunningham, TTG Sport. Argentina has won its 16th Copa America trophy after defeating Colombia 1-0 in the final match on Sunday. The win was the third straight major tournament title for Argentina following their 2021 Copa victory and their triumph in the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. For Colombia, whose only title came in the 2001 Copa America and who were unbeaten in 28 games, it was a disappointing night when a little seemed to work for Nesta Lorenzo's team. Securing their place in the 2024 Copa America, Jamaica advanced to the semi-finals of the 2023-2024 CONCACAF Nations League A after defeating Canada in the quarterfinals. However, Jamaica failed to progress after going down 3-1 to Ecuador back in the second match of Group B on June 26. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you so much for watching.